Well, good morning, church. My name is Evan Magnus, and I am super excited to get to preach for you all today. Um, if you're a guest with us today, I want to let you know we're especially glad that you're here. And I, I see some worried looks, so you'll be happy to know that no, we don't always have kids preaching every Sunday. So don't worry about that. Um, uh, and happy Mother's Day to all the mothers here. Um, I'm obviously not a mother, but I am a son of a mother, so I have sort of a glimpse of an idea of all that you do for us. And I'm so thankful for my mother who's here, and uh, all the mothers here, and all the mothers who have impacted my life. Um, well, we're in the middle of our year-long reading series through the New Testament, and we've just made it to the book of Acts. It's the story of God's church in light of the resurrection of Jesus. And what we're going to find is that everything has changed. In fact, this whole series, we've been looking at how the resurrection of Jesus changes everything. It changes our destiny. It changes the way we relate to the world. And what we're going to discover today is that it changes us. And that, I think, is pretty impressive. Because in my experience, change has been pretty hard. And if you don't believe me about that, uh, here's some proof for you that change is hard. Uh, did you know the first president to suggest that America switch to the metric system was Thomas Jefferson? In 1906, Alexander Graham Bell testified to Congress that American efficiency was suffering due to our unwieldy system of measures. Then, ten years later, the U.S. Metric Association was formed to promote the national switch to the metric system. In 1968, Congress funded a ten-year study that developed a ten-year plan to make the switch. And here we are, 50 years later, and I still have no idea what on earth a decimeter is. <laughs> if you know, I'd love to know, so you can find me after. Uh, but today, we're going to look at a story from God's Word that proves that real change is possible. We're going to learn that by the power of the resurrection, Jesus can make the weak strong, he can make cowards brave, and he can make the unqualified qualified. Now, our story is found in the fourth chapter of Acts, and already so much has changed. Acts begins just after the resurrection, and as we saw last week, right before Jesus leaves, he promises to leave us with the Holy Spirit. And he says that by the power of the Holy Spirit, Jesus' followers will be witnesses to the world. Then in the second chapter, the fun starts. The Holy Spirit comes on the disciples, and they begin to preach and share the good news that Jesus is alive. And he is now welcoming all people into God's family. And after that first sermon, more than 3,000 people make a decision to follow Christ. They begin a simple rhythm of eating together, worshiping in the temple, and sharing their possessions with those in need. Now our story st starts when Peter and John heal a lame man. And a huge crowd gathers around them to hear them talk about Jesus. Thousands more make a decision to follow Christ, but in the middle of their sermon, Peter and John are arrested and thrown in prison. We jump into the story the very next day as they're brought before the Sanhedrin, the high court of Jerusalem, to stand trial for preaching about Jesus. So if you have a Bible or a Bible app, you can follow along in there. The words are going to be on the screen. We're going to be in Acts chapter 4, starting with verse 5. The next day, the rulers and the elders and the teachers of the law met in Jerusalem. Annas, the high priest, was there, and so were Caiaphas, John, Alexander, and others of the high priest's family. They had Peter and John brought before them and began to question them. By what power or what name did you do this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers and elders of the people, if we are being called to account today for an act of kindness shown to a man who was lame and are being asked how he was healed, then know this, you and all the people of Israel, it is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead, that this man stands before you healed. Jesus is the stone you builders rejected, which has become the cornerstone. Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. Listen to this. When they saw the courage of Peter and John and realized they were unschooled, ordinary men, they were astonished, and they took note that these men had been with Jesus. 
All right. Well, I'm going to finish up the story in just a sec, but I want to pause here to notice something. There's a first big change that I notice, and it's one the Pharisees noticed too. Remember, they said they were unschooled, ordinary men. What I get from that is that being with Jesus makes the unqualified qualified. That seems to be all it takes. These were unschooled, ordinary men. I mean, they were fishermen. They were on the bottom rungs of society, and now here they are, arguing in the highest court of the land. And their only qualification is the fact that that they had been with Jesus. Now, normally, of course, this isn't how things work. I mean, you don't get in shape by hanging out with people who work out a lot. Uh, My friend Ethan is a pole vaulter. I hang out with him all the time, but if you asked me to bend a pole in such a way that it would fling me up into the air, well, I would look at you like you were crazy. But being with Jesus is different. What we see from Peter and John is that there's something about time spent with Jesus that changes a person. And all the qualifications they needed to be witnesses for Jesus was to be with Jesus and to be faithful to his mission. It's like Paul wrote to the young leader Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 1. He said, he has saved us and called us to a holy life, not because of anything we have done, but by his own purpose and grace. This grace was given to us in Christ Jesus before the beginning of time, but it has now been revealed to us through the appearing of our Savior Christ Jesus, who has destroyed death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. And I think that makes sense. If God can make a dead person live again and make a sinful person forgiven, then I think God can probably make an unqualified person ready for ministry. And in fact, that's exactly what God loves to do. God loves to take the unqualified people and use them for amazing things by the power of God's Spirit. There are countless examples of God doing this throughout the Bible. This is certainly what God did with the first disciples. I mean, the Pharisees were right. These were unschooled, ordinary men from the bottom of society with very little to offer. Yet God used them to do amazing things. Because their main qualification wasn't anything more than the fact that they had been with Jesus. Or David, who God picked to unite God's people. He was the smallest of his family with a hot temper and poor judgment. Or Paul, he wrote more books of the Bible than anyone else. But his main qualification for ministry was years spent killing Christians. And then he met Jesus, and it changed everything. So that's the first thing I noticed from this text. The first thing that has changed is that these disciples, with no formal training, no position or power, are moving the mission of God forward just because... They have been with Jesus, and they are trusting in the Holy Spirit. So apparently, being with Jesus, just being with Jesus, makes the unqualified qualified. So if you're worried that you're not qualified enough to serve Jesus, well, all you have to do is spend more time with him. See, 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 spending time with Jesus is the only preparation that you need to be a witness for him. It worked for Peter and John, and it can work for you. All right, well, let's jump back into our story. Peter and John have just said their piece. The Pharisees are amazed, and they notice that these men have been with Jesus, and now they have to figure out what they're going to do. Acts chapter 4, starting with verse 14. They could see the man who had been healed standing there with them, so there was nothing they could say. So they ordered them to withdraw from the Sanhedrin and then conferred together. What are we going to do with these men, they asked. Everyone living in Jerusalem knows they have performed a notable sign, and we cannot deny it. But to stop this thing from spreading any further among the people, we must warn them to speak no longer to anyone in this name. Then they called them in again and commanded them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John replied, Which is right in God's eyes, to listen to you or to him? You be the judges. As for us, we cannot help speaking about what we have seen 
and heard. After further threats, they let them go. They could not decide how to punish them because all the people were praising God for what had happened. For the man who was miraculously healed was over 40 years old. All right, we're going to pause here one more time because we have encountered another huge change in the lives of Peter and John. Just a few days with the resurrected Jesus, and these guys are fearless. Here's the next truth from this text. Being with Jesus makes cowards brave. Faced with threats and commanded to silence, they stand up before the whole court and declare their allegiance to God first. Which is right in God's eyes, to listen to you or to him? You be the judges. As for us, we cannot help speaking about what we have seen and heard. These two guys are totally different men from just two months earlier. When Jesus was arrested, John scattered with the other disciples. Peter hung around just a bit later only to deny Jesus three times. He couldn't even stand up for Jesus under pressure from a servant girl. And now, they can both stand up risking their lives to spread the message of the gospel in the highest court in the land. So apparently, all it takes is a little resurrection to make cowards brave. And we need this kind of bravery today. Because all of us are faced with the same big choice that faced Peter and John. Just as Peter and John were placed on trial, we too are placed on trial every day by those around us. I think we can all relate to Peter in the courtyard. I definitely know what it is to deny Christ under pressure or to give up an opportunity to be a witness to others. You see, we always have a choice between listening to God or to the world around us, to listening to God's word or to the word of a political party, or a Hollywood actor, or just our friends at work or school. I mean, this is essentially just peer pressure. What Peter faced in the courtyard was a textbook example of what I face at school every day. He was given a clear choice to be a witness to those around him, to say, I know him. But instead, he denied Christ and listened to the world around him. And this may be your situation. Many of us are facing this very test. Our friends, our work, the books we are reading, the culture we are a part of are all pressuring us one way while God is saying something completely different. And we all need to decide who we're going to listen to. And the fact of the matter is it's going to take bravery to stand and choose the path of God over the path of the world. This is why Paul gives Timothy this crucial counsel about what the Spirit of God has given us. In 2 Timothy, Timothy chapter 1, he says, for the, Spirit of God, for the Spirit that God gave us does not make us timid, but gives us power, love, and self-discipline. And maybe you need some help from the Holy Spirit. Maybe that courage that Paul is talking about is the courage that you need right now. If so, here's what I learned from Peter and John who were obviously full of power, love, and self-discipline. If you need courage to choose to follow God rather than to follow other people, spend time with Jesus. I'm going to say that one more time because I think it's important. If you need courage to choose to follow God rather than to follow other people, spend time with Jesus. All right, well, we're going to get back to the story. Peter and John have just stood trial for preaching, and now the Sanhedrin have decided to let them go. We're going to pick back up in verse 23. On their release, Peter and John went back to their own people and reported all the chief priests and elders had said to them. When they heard this, they raised their voices together in prayer to God. Sovereign Lord, they said, you made the heavens and the earth and the sea and everything in them. You spoke by the Holy Spirit through the mouth of your servant, our father David. The nations make their noise and the people make futile plans when the kings of the earth and the rulers of nations rise up against the Lord and against his anointed one. Indeed, Herod and Pontius Pilate met together with the Gentiles and the people of Israel in this city 
to conspire against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed. They did what your power and will decided beforehand should happen. Now, Lord, consider their threats and... All right, I'm going to stop here for one, for one moment because I'm wondering, how would you finish that prayer? Now, Lord, consider their threats and... Because I know how I would finish that prayer. I would pray, now, Lord, consider their threats and help us to keep our mouths shut. Or, now, Lord, consider their threats and protect us while we worship as quietly as possible. Or, now, Lord, consider their threats and make sure nobody kills us. I think that's a pretty reasonable prayer. If it were me, I would pray a prayer asking for safety, asking for protection. But that's not what they pray. Now, Lord, Consider their threats and enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. Stretch out your hand to heal and perform signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. After they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. So, being with Jesus makes the unqualified qualified. Being with Jesus makes cowards brave. And what we learn from this prayer is that being with Jesus makes people pray the most ridiculous prayers you have ever heard of in your entire life. I guess once you have seen a dead man live again, you don't really worry too much about praying risky prayers. And just to be clear, this is a risky prayer. They are intentionally praying that God will do the very thing that has and will lead to their arrest. And this is not an idle threat by the Sanhedrin. The arrests start in chapter 5, and the executions begin in chapter 7, and by chapter 8, Christians are being driven from the city. I mean, this is like those people who stand in an extra long line just to sit at the front of a roller coaster. They're just asking for a scarier ride. These people are crazy. And notice, it isn't just Peter and John who are praying this crazy prayer. We already talked about how they're brave, but it's clear that bravery was a feature of the whole church. The entire church was insane. They're praying for boldness to do the very thing that will put their lives at risk. Because a prayer like this only makes sense if you believe that death has been defeated and that the grave has no more power. In fact, if we really believe in the resurrection, if we really believe that Jesus has promised life eternal, then maybe we're the weird ones when we are more likely to pray a prayer asking for protection than asking for boldness. If you want to train to pray brave prayers, then maybe we need to look at Romans chapter 8. Paul writes, for I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Folks, we have nothing more to fear. So here's my question for you. What kind of prayer would you pray if you were going to pray a brave prayer? Prayers asking for protection are great. Prayers of healing are wonderful. Keep praying those prayers. Those prayers are important and God wants to hear them. But I'm asking, in your current struggle, trying to choose to follow God rather than to follow other people, what kind of prayer would you pray if you were going to pray a brave prayer? prayer? Would you pray a prayer asking for a chance to share your faith? Would you pray for an opportunity to reconcile with a family member? Would you pray for the chance to apologize to someone that you've hurt? What kind of prayer would you pray if you were going to pray a brave prayer? You see, Acts 4 is a picture of God's people as a result 
of the resurrection. Because of Jesus' resurrection, the unqualified are qualified, the cowards are brave, and the prayers are bold. Because if God can conquer death, then God can do anything. God can use people for his ministry that don't seem qualified. God can make you brave enough to choose him over the world. And if God can conquer death, then we have nothing to fear. So why not pray brave prayers? And this can be your life. If you want to serve Jesus, just spend some time with him. If you want to follow God rather than the world, hang out with Jesus enough for him to change your mind. And if you want to pray brave prayers, then just trust that Jesus has risen from the dead and realize that nothing in this world can stand between you and God or between you and God's power. And pray, pray for this resurrecting God to work in your life. Let's pray. Dear God, I pray for courage. I pray for power, love, and self-discipline. I pray that we, like Peter and John, will figure out that the secret to unlocking the power of the Holy Spirit is simply to spend time with Jesus. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.